Welcome to the sixth season of Jimmy's Jobs of the Future. Now in series five, we went round some of the great institutions of the United Kingdom, including the Bank of England and the next Prime Minister of the UK. This series, we're returning to our roots a little bit. And today we're speaking to Romy from Pension B, which is one of the most impressive entrepreneurship stories of the last decade in the UK. She founded the company in 2015 and has since taken it all the way through various funding rounds right up to IPOing on the London Stock Exchange in the last couple of years. It's a great and inspiring story, demonstrating that perhaps even in the most traditional of industries, such as pensions, exciting brands can be formed and amazing companies can make a difference to people's lives, making them more financially secure. We went to Pension B's offices in London to record this. It's a super episode. As always, let us know what you think in the comments below. Romy, welcome to Jimmy's Jobs of the Future. Thank you for having me. So tell us, what's in the name Pension B? Where did that come from? Well, Pension B is a little bit like the gift that keeps on giving for us. We wanted a name that clearly told people the company is about pensions um, and therefore pension clearly met the mark. And the B is there to connote a whole variety of different themes and emotions when it comes to our working lives. So like the worker bees, our customers have often had many different jobs. They come to us to help them manage the pensions that they have left behind in those different jobs. We often see ourselves as bees too and have a variety of different roles within the company that refer to bees, such as our customers' personal beekeepers who look after them in terms of customer success or the nectar collectors who deal with pension providers and the administrative background. Um, the, the name Pension Bee really helps us to convey a lot of the messaging behind what it means to have a career, to work jobs, to save in pensions, to combine pensions. Um, and so it, it felt like the right name for the company. And um, my dad actually came up with it in the very early days. Yeah. How did he come up with it? What, what, and what were the names you had before? Well, the main challenge at that time was to find something that connoted the themes and the brand of the company while making sure that the dot com was available. Yeah. Uh, and so there was a whole variety of different ways to, to settle on Pension B. But the moment I heard it and the moment I thought about what it conveyed and the moment I saw the yellow, I thought, this has got to be us. This is it. And we're here at your offices, which are very B themed and yellow and black throughout. <laughs> Talk to us about the early stages, because you raised a pretty large seed round of a, of a million pounds. How did you go about doing that? Well, with the financial services business, you often need quite a long runway in order to be able to develop the product, in order to be able to develop the infrastructure around the product, in order to be able to um, set in place the regulatory infrastructure that you need as well. Um, and so within financial technology, it took a lot of you know, explaining as to what we would be doing for the first 12 months, which is really the runway that we that we sought to achieve with the raise. Um, I would say that, you know, at Pension B, we were quite fortunate in terms of having had previous relationships and connections from uh, from a pa from past careers um, that enabled us to have that kind of network. Um, where people were looking to make investments, were looking to make EIS investments, um, as you know, many fintech companies are. Um, and, and of course, I think what really helped is the fact that the vast majority of shareholders realized they wanted to be customers too. Yeah. Um, and, and saw themselves as being in that problem, you know, where you've had a couple of jobs, you've left a couple of pensions behind, and you know, how great would it be to, to have them in one place so you can save more for the future? And it was 2015 because you, the story is that you had tried to kind of amalgamate your pensions and it had been so difficult. So classic kind of entrepreneur meets problem. I'm going to try and sort it out. And what were the first hires that you made? Because like you say, going, doing a financial services company, there's a lot of regulation involved with that. There's people's money, obviously, that you're looking after. So what were the first hires you made? Well, I think you need to think about 
the hires that you need, but also the ecosystem that you need to set up. Um, and I'll come to the hires in a minute, but I think what was really important for the ecosystem is having the right partners. So we decided very early on that we want to partner with the world's largest asset managers who would ensure that we have access to world-class investing products, global flagship products, as we, as we often refer to them. Um, and so setting up the ecosystem and finding the partners in the form of the asset managers and we work with BlackRock and State Street and Legal in general um, was a very key foundational step because, you know, as you said, we're talking about people's pensions and there needs to be the confidence that they are invested by experts, which they are. So, so once we had substantial parts of the ecosystem set up, um, it was important to find the right skill sets to be able to deliver a business that scales over many decades um, because the pensions market is enormous. And so we can easily see ourselves serving customers in the millions of, um, you know, in, in the millions of the consumer space. Um, and, and so the, the first hires really had to focus on the core skill sets. And so together with Jonathan, um, who is the CTO of the company, we we covered, I think, the main basis, which is me on the financial services side and Jonathan on the technology side. We then quite quickly hired um, Jasper, our CMO on the marketing side, because we knew that we would need to build a brand that spoke to people about this enormous need of planning for retirement, even though pensions can often be seen as a bit of a dull subject. Um, and so Jasper, you know, our CMO, our current CMO was incredibly important um, in building out the proposition that would appeal to customers. And then on the operation side, we, we had Tess, um, who is our current COO, because we knew that working with thousands of different pension providers would undoubtedly be complicated. And our job was to make it simple for our customers. And this, yeah, we've known each other for a little bit. It is your lifelong passion, isn't it? I mean, this is what you want to dedicate it to. For those that are listening and not watching on YouTube, you're in your kind of mid thirties and it's quite unusual to have the CEO of a now a publicly listed company at, at that age. And this is what you're going to work on for 20, 30 years or so. Yeah, absolutely. I love the company. I love our customers. I think what really drives me, what makes me happy is reading when we have changed someone's life and the way that they feel when they feel like they are prepared for or preparing for retirement and the confidence that gives the I guess the peace of mind that that you know that that achieves it's incredibly rewarding and purposeful to be building a business that that does that because it is in terms of pensions particularly as the kind of workforce changes and people have more jobs and, you know, the, the whole kind of squiggly career kind of concepts, pensions and organizing them becomes even more um, daunting in some ways to do that. And you do take people from a position of having kind of 10, 12 pension pots, you know, and people can have that by actually their mid thirties or absolutely, so, you know, and you take that and put it all together and it can often be surprising how much people have. And that must feel kind of incredibly empowering knowing that you are helping people with the second biggest investment that they'll ever make probably behind property. Yeah. And many people won't even get on the property ladder. So for them, it will actually be the biggest investment that, that they have. I think it, for me personally, it combines a lot of different factors that I'm, that I'm very passionate about. You know, I think one is purpose and making sure that whatever you do in life achieves something for others, because I think that that is what ultimately creates happiness in, in one's professional career. I think pensions are also, for me, incredibly exciting because they invest in literally every single company um, in the world. And having that oversight and that view to what the world of business is doing for people and how we can also influence it to be better um, is incredibly motivational and exciting as well. 
And then finally, I would just say, you know, as, as a company, we we have a large employee base. Um, we employ close to 200 people and seeing the way that a workplace can be um, and the feedback that we get from our team, I think is incredibly important as well, because ultimately you want even more people to be on this journey of helping our customers to save for their retirements. Yeah. And that, those employees that you have, it's still quite a nimble sort of team though, actually, for like a publicly listed company, because you founded it in 2015 and then you know, listed a couple of years ago and also moved to the premium listed market, which is a very technical point that I want to come, <laughs> come back to. But those 200 employees, where, where have you made hires that you perhaps didn't expect to? Well, quite early on, we decided that we would like to be able to hire people who have experience in pensions, but also people who don't necessarily have experience in pensions. And that reflects the fact that many people in the country um, have not had experience with pensions, even though they are invested in pensions automatically through, through their workplace. And so we wanted our team to very much be representative of our customer base, um, whether that is from the perspective of, you know, not being you know, not having had a lifelong career in financial services or whether that's from the perspective of diversity um, or whether that's from the, you know, perspective of being, you know, job hoppers. Um, we, we wanted our team to reflect our customer base. Um, and so I think the, the most, you know, surprising thing about us is that, you know, we hire in an exceptionally broad way um, and what we seek to do is bring the skill sets into the company that we need to, you know, to make the company successful. Um, so on the marketing side, being a pensions marketeer um, is not necessarily what is going to make pension be successful. Yeah. It might, but there are other skill sets and other qualities and other marketing attributes that you know, we can learn from to make pensions more engaging and, and more appealing. And similarly, on the customer success side, having been in pensions customer service, which aside from Pension B is often known as being exceptionally um, challenging, yeah. may not be, you know, the best way to bring the expertise that you want, that you want in-house. We seek to bring in the best experience um, that can make Pension B successful and relatable for, for our customer base. And what are you looking for when it comes to marketing? Because you're right, like traditional pensions marketing, I mean, it sounds about as dull as ditch water, right? like <laughs> about, but you're doing a lot of innovative things when it, when it comes to that. Um, and so what kind of skills are you looking for when it comes to pension marketing? Well, the belief that pensions impacts everybody throughout their lives is really what's important. And so the way we think about marketing um, is that we want to reach as big an audience as we possibly can. Roughly 25 million people in the country have pensions that could benefit from consolidation. And so we, we look to achieve a very, very broad reach. And that means being active across all different types of marketing channels, whether that's TV, whether that's out of home, whether that's search, um, you know, whether that is on, on radio, um, whether that's sponsorships, we we sponsor the the Brentford Bees. Yeah. Like I said, the the Bees is you know something that we're um, very passionate about. We you know we seek to reach as many people as as possible, and so on the marketing side, we look for analysis and expertise in those particular channels. Um, but what I think we're very proud of is that a lot of our marketing team um, have actually been in our customer success team previously. And so they know our customers firsthand yeah. uh, and they can use that knowledge that they have of our customer base into the way that they develop our marketing approach. And I know that's something you're very proud of is the amount of people that of those kind of 200 that have been here since the, since the start, it's not been a kind of high turnover. And that's partly down to the kind of like, I know you put a lot of work into the kind of culture and the, and the value side of things. I wanted to ask about one in particular, which I know you see as a kind of distinctive sort of prospect, and that's you have the value of, of love, which if, you know, it was 
if one of your previous employers, Goldman's or Morgan Stanley, had that kind of value, I think we'd all be quite uh, suspect about it. But what does that mean to you? And how do you kind of bring that into a, a workplace? Because that's, in, it's a very, uh, it, obviously a very emotive feeling, the most emotive feeling perhaps. Um, how do you bring that into a workplace? Well, love is one of our five values. Um, and those values were set up very early on, very early in the days of the company. And, and I think they are values that stand the test of time because they are so universal, like the feeling of, of love, as you say. Um, what we have been working on more recently is something called the culture code. And what I believe with values is that they need to be set by the people who are expected to live by them. Uh, and so through various, um, you know, engagements with our team, um, through various focus groups, through various discussions, we have continued to refresh those values over the years. And the, the most recent refresh has resulted in the culture code, which is a very simple set of, you know, when we see people living the value of love, this is a typical do. Um, and when we see people not living the value of love, this is a typical don't. And they're not supposed to be exhaustive in any way, but they do provide guidance on what, you know, it looks like when you are living the value of love or quality or, or honesty. Um, when it comes to the value of love, I think the most perceptible way to be living it is the way that you interact with your colleagues on a daily basis. And the phrase we often use is whether that is coming from a place of love. So you can still be honest, which is one of our other values, honesty, but it needs to be coming from a place of love. Um, and we've had quite a few um, cultural workshops where we have actually practiced in live settings what it looks like for us to be living by the value of love and what it doesn't look like for us to be living by the value of love. Um, and so I think as with all of these things, um, it, it comes down to how far are you prepared to go to live the values, to demonstrate the values and ultimately to work on the values to, to show that they are important. Yeah. And so, because well, one of the things that you talk about is the fact that you, you know, life is work. And when you're an entrepreneur, it's what you, it is what kind of defines you and becomes a huge part of it. I'm curious with a value like that in terms of how do you map it over with people that you, you hire? Because it's never going to be, they're never going to kind of be invested in it as, as you are. Um, and I, that must be an interesting challenge. So talk us through how those kind of like workshops work with other individuals. Cause I think it's, it's fascinating to have, you know, the concept of love at work and what that, that means. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think. We do have a very distinctive culture. So I, I suppose I would start by saying that I expect that we attract people who align with our values. And that is part of the appeal of having a very strong values led culture. We tend to attract people, you know, who like that and who want to be in the kind of workplace that is, you know, that is like that. Um, and, and that is not for everybody. Right. And yeah. and that's fine. We want to attract people who want to live by our values. So I would say that's the first point. And so therefore, when we get together, we are already starting from a base of, you know, people think this is right. Right. And, and so the question is, how do we get a deeper understanding and a deeper practice of that? Um, and so one of the one of the culture takeovers that we have done in our weekly um, in our weekly town halls, um, we call them show and tells, and we have since day one, we have them weekly, um, is to practice giving each other feedback. Yeah. Um, which I think anyone, you know, regardless of how, you know, senior or experienced you are in a company can find really, really difficult. But the way that we give each other feedback and being able to do that regularly, being able to do it informally, um, is really important to building, um, you know, building a successful and efficient and productive workplace. So we, we actually live practiced between two individuals what this would 
what this would look like. Um, and others had the opportunity to see that and to comment on it and to, I hope, reflect on, you know, the way that they might give feedback and conversely take feedback, yeah. um, which is another important element of our, of our culture code. So I think that there are many different ways that you can invigorate your culture, uh, that you can bring people along with you. And the stronger your culture is, the more visible it is, the more likely you are to also attract people who value that culture. I quite agree. And um, yeah, it's fascinating to hear how that, that takes place. Um, to move to the more technical bit, you listed on the London Stock Exchange and kind of like in the sort of, you know, game of entrepreneurship, it is seen as such a big kind of stage, the entrepreneurship, almost for some people, it's seen as the kind of final stage. Um, obviously that's not been the case for you, given what we've talked about, but it was an incredibly quick journey in terms of it. And this is something that the UK government wants to happen a, a lot more, right? And traditionally we've had a lot of people that sort of sell out earlier on. Just talk to us about that moment of kind of ringing the bell of the London Stock Exchange. Yeah, how did it? How did it feel? Could you slightly believe that it it had happened and it had happened so quickly? Well, we had this very um, fortunate, I suppose, setup where we got to be at the LSE twice. Uh, once when we did our listing on the high growth segment, and then the second time when we moved to to the premium segment. Um, and actually, the the high growth segment. Um, listing the very first time we were at the exchange was under COVID times. Uh, and so we had to maintain a lot of social distancing, but I was very adamant that I wanted to bring my, at the time, two children um, with me. And so they came to the stock exchange. They, um, they played with the balloons and that's probably actually the most vivid memory for me, having my children there and trying to keep them under control. Um, the, you know, the next time, um, that we did it was around the move to the premium segment. And that was the time that, that we got to go there in the morning. Um, you know, you, you kind of pick up this, this plaque, um, if you will, and you, you know, you place it in the right place. Um, and that is supposed to open the market. And of course, the only thing you're thinking is, oh my gosh, what if I put it in the wrong place? Is the market not going to open? Uh, but of course, the LSE is well prepared for Before any that, of those yeah. of those doubts. And yes, of course, the the market will open. Um, but you know, they they do a, they do a great job of playing some, you know, of playing really kind of emotional and and sort of tense music. Um, and I got the chance to to give a speech to the people who were you know who were gathered in the room. And seeing that group of people who have been with us since the company was literally a piece of paper, right? A PowerPoint presentation was incredibly emotional. Um, and what, you know, what I think really mattered to me and what I think really mattered to everyone in the room is that being there, having achieved that um, was even more important because of the kind of company that we are and because of the kind of culture and because of the kind of values that, that we have. Um, and it definitely wasn't lost on me that, you know, I, I was one of a few women mm -hmm. who have had the opportunity to give that speech. Um, and, and so, you know, I will look back on that day, incredibly fond on those days, incredibly fondly with, in, you know, very happy memories. Um, but at the same time, it is one part of a journey because, you know, the big ambition is to solve the retirement problem for millions of people. And, and, and this is on the route of getting there. To do that. And how have you found the experience since being on the, the stock market? Because a lot of kind of entrepreneurial founders have found it, you know, sort of quite tough. What's happened with valuations have been sort of, you know, particularly in the kind of economic climate that we live in at the moment have been pretty choppy to say the, the least. How have you found that thus far? Well, we are in the business of pensions. So we're all about long-term returns. And when you look at history, what you do tend to find is there are times of market volatility. They impact public and private companies. I don't believe that, you know, being private has made anybody immune from valuation cycles. Um, and so 
the most important thing to remember about stock markets and about being listed is that this is a very long-term commitment. It's a form of ownership structure. Um, and commitment to the ownership structure is what really matters to create long-term returns for shareholders. And that's something that, you know, we in the pensions business feel very aligned to because pensions are going to be there for a long time and our share ownership structure is going to be there for a long time. So I, I, I think that for us, it aligns our incentives and the way that we operate the business very well. Um, but undoubtedly, you know, short term cycles are here. You know, they're they're always going to be here. And if anything, I think they present excellent opportunities, you know, for people who have, you know, who have savings to deploy. Um, and we, we definitely always emphasize that message in pensions when when the market's on sale. You know, that may be a good time to make pension contributions. And have you found it a sort of a positive experience, the actual kind of listing of it? Because like you say, you go from a PowerPoint deck of sort of, you know, 12, 18 pages and so on. And then all of a sudden, you know, seven years later, the whole world can kind of peer in and, and see what you're doing and make comments. And for a lot of entrepreneurs find that, you know, it's, it's a very different skill set, partly. Um, but also it's, you know, you get challenged by people that, you know, almost have no idea of the, of the kind of business and the, the sweat and the tears that you've, you've put into it. So. How have you had to kind of adapt your skill set to kind of match those different things that required? Yeah, I, I suppose I would say that my previous background has always been in very large financial institutions. So, um, you know, I, I, I worked at Goldman Sachs, I worked at Morgan Stanley, um, which are obviously both public companies. And so having seen, you know, the way that um, the way that it is done in, in quote unquote, uh, you know, in, in inverted commas, gives you a perspective on what to expect. Now, obviously, I want to do things differently. Yeah. Um, <laughs> exactly. and, and so there is a very helpful baseline of knowing the way things are done and understanding what the requirements are, while also understanding how you can be a leader um, in the face of, of those requirements. So I do think that the past experience is helpful in terms of knowing what people's expectations are. But at the same time, the reason we are successful is because we're different. And so you need to find the right balancing um, act of making sure that your leadership can shine um, while also making sure that people's expectations are, are being met. And, and so that is really no different to the balancing that you need to achieve while you are scaling a business. There are always stakeholder requirements that need to be balanced. And I think, you know, the more you arm yourself, the more you talk to stakeholders, the more you understand expectations, the, the more you can find that balance. Yeah, no, absolutely. One of the benefits of doing these recordings in person and using a notebook is that I'm pretty sure that Romy can see what I'm writing down and always <laughs> answers my next question that I have anticipated on, on that side of it. I mean, perhaps the question I would like to ask then is, is how you sort of, you know, change from being a sort of big finance person to when it was just you almost around a kitchen table, starting with an idea, you know, how, what kind of, what did you have to almost unlearn the skills you had to kind of, um, put to one side almost, and which new ones did you have to bring in when you started out? Because I think there's a lot of people at the moment who work in finance and for those big houses that you kind of mentioned, and partly because of the pandemic are thinking now about trying to do their own thing or trying to start something on the, on the side because they want the purpose and the things that you've talked about and they want to build that and those places aren't necessarily sort of, um, you know, completely open to those types yeah. of things. So what, what were the, what advice would you be giving to the kind of, you know, the, the Romy of seven, eight years ago that was just starting out? Well, I think that there are skill sets that are incredibly helpful for you to have. So skill sets like managing projects, managing to deadlines, getting things done, um, understanding the world of communicating businesses, communicating concepts, communicating value. You know, those are all skill sets that are highly transferable. Um, I think 
one of the skill sets that you really need to hone in on once you leave this very structured environment where things tend to happen by default um, is the skill set around decision making and really being able to make decisions, being able to make decisions quite rapidly um, and being able to own those decisions. And I would say understanding how those decisions impact all of your stakeholders. Within large organizations, you rarely have responsibility for that. Yeah. Within young companies, you're responsible for every decision uh, that gets made. So I think a lot of it is about a change in mindset Yeah. to be a decision maker um, and to, you know, because nothing happens by default. If you don't make decisions, literally nothing happens. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I think that's very true. And yeah, the ability to, you yeah, know, take decisions and, yeah, uh, and, and move fast as people talk about. Um, I want to talk about one of the key stakeholders, which is kind of the government and the kind of regulatory environment towards the end. But sort of flowing into that is the kind of rise of environmental social governance investing, which I know Pension B has kind of been at the, at the forefront of and people wanting to invest with more purpose. And I do think one of the amazing things about technology we talked about, you know, actually with Rishi Sunak is the fact that people can see now their investments much more easily. They can see it through their phone and so on. And that is making a big difference. And one of the things that you said earlier stuck with me a little bit was the fact that, you know, people can invest in every company in the, in the world and people Sometimes the challenges I think are that people don't realize actually what they're invested in through their pension or don't think they've got any investments at all. And so I think it's one of the things that as a country we could do more is to try and actually open up those, like make it more transparent in terms of where people are investing. But talk to us about what, how you see ESG and how you kind of made those first moves into the market and where do you think. ESG goes now in a time of kind of inflation at 10% and so on. Does it become less important? I think if anything, it probably becomes more important um, because I think the need for it actually becomes greater. Um, yeah. You know, the need for us to be doing better by the environment, by, by society is, is becoming more and more important. So... Our journey with ESG investment started as most of our journeys do with a customer problem and customer demand. And we were receiving feedback in, in the very early days that customers wanted to find a way to invest more responsibly, more in line with their values. Um, and we therefore sought out an investment plan um, that would invest more of their money in companies exhibiting good behaviors and less of their money in companies exhibiting not so good behaviors. Um, and what that meant in practice was that, you know, more of your money would be invested in good oil companies like yeah. Shell um, and less of your money would be invested in bad oil companies, possibly in other parts of the world. Um, and so we launched this plan, we, we, we brought it to market and it, it had great success, but increasingly we started hearing from customers that they don't want to be invested in oil at all. They don't care if you're a good oil producer or a bad oil producer. They want to be invested in a world that is the world of tomorrow um, and in a world where we are not reliant on massive oil producers. And at the time, a product like this didn't exist. Um, the concept of excluding some of the world's biggest oil producers from mainstream pension funds was literally unheard of. Um, and so we had to work, you know, quite hard with the partner to develop the fossil fuel free plan. Um, and, and so we did. And that was um, launched um, around the end of 2020. Uh, it's one of our top three plans now. So it has found, you know, great success. But the debate continues to move on. And so we have been hearing from customers in that plan, from customers in some of our other plans, that they are not only looking to exclude, you know, bad actors entirely, um, but they are also wanting to proactively invest in companies that are achieving impact. So you start again to come up, you know, with questions around, well, what does that mean? You know, does it mean 
that you are helping to, you know, solve some of the, you know, um, sustainable development goals. Um, but sometimes there are conflicts between those. How do you, how do you define that? Um, and so we've actually been doing a lot of work with our customers to find an impact led plan that shows, you know, and, and that really demonstrates within the, within the holdings of the plan, companies that are making the world a better place. And how do you define, or is it you that defines what is a good and what is a bad oil company? Because that is, you know, it's who, who makes that decision? Because of course, everyone's purpose and values are slightly different as we've talked about already. Yeah. I think this really comes down to listening, you know, what customers have to say. Um, and there are a lot of ways to decide who is a good oil company and, and who is a bad oil company. And you know, for many consumers, that will be enough. But what we have found is that there is a very, very large contingent of savers that do not want exposure to fossil fuels at all. Yeah. And so whether you're good or whether you're bad is almost entirely irrelevant. Um, there are, of course, within some of our other products, ways to, um, you know, ways to measure that. You know, someone who is good might be committed to you know, to 2050. Um, and they would likely have a credible, you know, emission reduction plan in place. That emission reduction plan will be tied to management compensation targets that are transparent and well understood. Um, and ultimately, there needs to be credibility and belief in the deliverability of those targets, which span past yeah. the tenure of the vast majority of chief executives. And, and so a lot of customers, you know, they they just don't believe that those, you know, th that those targets will be met because they don't believe the right incentives are there. And for them, they want to exclude those companies entirely. For other customers, it will be enough. And, and so you need to listen to where customers are um, and, and what suits their beliefs. But there are definitely, you know, pockets um, and actually very large contingents that do have more uniform views than this, you know, every person is different. Every person has different values, um, you know, might, might lead you to believe. And speaking of different views and different values, that segues us neatly onto the government and so on. You're in a highly regulated industry. How do you go about kind of engaging with government and what more do you think government could do to kind of improve the entrepreneurial landscape? Having been, you know, from seed idea all the way through to IPO. What are your kind of reflections on that journey? Well, I think um, in every entrepreneurial journey, there are battles to be fought. Um, and I think that for every business, depending on the environment that you're in, those, those battles will be different. But it often comes down to incumbents um, and large legacy players who have a strong interest in maintaining the status quo, um, being disrupted and therefore fighting back against that disruption. Um, and my view is that by and large, entrepreneurial companies are here and are motivated by making things better for consumers. And actually, the government should be exceptionally well aligned with making things better for consumers because that's, you know, that's the electorate. And so I would encourage government to listen quite carefully to what it is we need to be able to achieve progress and competitiveness and growth within the economy, um, because there are quite a lot of solutions that I think are you know, and in this day and age, it's really important that are free, yeah. um, you know, for, for us to deliver for consumers to, you know, to make their lives better. And one of the ones we've been really passionate about is the pension switch guarantee, yeah. um, which enables consumers to have the confidence that their pension providers will honor their interests when it comes to moving their money and will, will honor their wishes. Um, and that still remains elusive. Um, we have a um, outdated legislation from 1993 that allows pension providers six months uh, to honor a transfer switch request. 
And, you know, six months, I think, in this day and age um, is, is simply not good enough. It's out of line with what other countries have in place. And so there are things like this. There are reforms that, that we can make um, that make it easier to, you know, to do things. Um, so the people don't get stuck in a paper quagmire. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and what, but your reflections on the kind of entrepreneurial journey, what were the biggest challenges at that? So take the kind of sector sort of challenges out of it. Just being a entrepreneur in the United Kingdom, because one of the things that strikes me is how fast the agenda moves. And in, and in five years time, it'll be, it'll be a different set of challenges or there'll be certain solutions available to those challenges. As somebody who's kind of, yeah, very recently IPO'd and so on, what looking back over the years would have been the greatest help to the kind of entrepreneurial ecosystem for you? Well, I think it's safe to say that in the UK, the investment landscape doesn't always understand what it means you know, to build fast growth businesses, except where we have had targeted government interventions. And so I would point to one of the successes. Okay. So one of the successes that we have had in stimulating fast growth companies has been the EIS scheme. Yes. Um, and that makes it attractive for individual investors to invest in companies that are you know, set to grow quickly, um, that are set to disrupt, that, you know, ideally have an element of, you know, technological um, capability and, and progress within the business plan. And there is a, there is a risk sharing there, you know, with, with the government. Um, but ultimately, it's up to the individuals to make the investment decision. And so I think that type of program and, and that program has really been held as very successful because it incentivizes individuals to think about opportunities. And, and so I think what we need to see is more of that risk sharing and ultimately rewarding because, you know, HMRC is left in a much better place if we have successful businesses in the country, but ultimately risk sharing and risk rewarding between investors and between government. Um, and we've done it very well in the early stages. I don't think we've cracked the nut yet um, in in the scale up and and growth phase. So, well, exactly. I mean, EIS numbers haven't been updated for ten years now, right? So it's a challenge. But it is one of the things that is actually a Brexit opportunity in terms of the allows more kind of flexibility um, around those. So yeah, it's a uh, it's hard though for entrepreneurs as well. I think one of my reflections of it and kind of being more in the entrepreneurial world now than in the government world is just how busy entrepreneurs are building businesses. And because the challenges you talk about around status quo, et cetera, it just means it's very hard for entrepreneurs to kind of, um, make change with, with government because it's, it's easier to stick to the status quo. It's less risk averse and actually entrepreneurs are busy hiring people, building companies and, and so on. So it's a, it's a real challenge for that. Absolutely. And I think ultimately what you want is confidence that there will be ongoing government stability so that the relationships <laughs> that you build yeah. um, are relationships that endure. Exactly. Yeah. For anyone listening to this well into the future, we're currently in the middle of a conservative <laughs> leadership election deciding another prime minister. So it's a, it's a challenge. Hence why I'm sort of smiling around that. Um, to touch on the more kind of like personal sides. Um, you've had the story of growing from idea to IPO within eight years. Uh, during that time, you've also had three children as well, five, three and zero. What are the kind of reflections on that? And again, I guess I asked from a very personal side, having had two kids in the last two years as well, of, of just how you kind of manage all of that. I think you just need to accept a very low level of sleep predictability, as I would call it. Um, there is never a great time to have children. Or there is, start a there is never a great time. And, and so I think you need to take the long-term view and think about, you know, what do I want my life to be like in, in 10, 15 years time? And, you know, will children enrich that life? And for me, it was very much the case that they, that they do and they will. Um, and so you just, 
you just have to get on with it, I think. And, you know, the biggest game changer for me, I think, has been having a supportive partner, um, someone who is um, aligned with me in the same way around what we want for our family, but also what we want, you know, from from our careers. Um, we're actually a, a joint entrepreneurial household, um, which, uh, you know, which is challenging and creates a lot of, um, you know, a lot of needs for coordination and organization. And and the other thing I would say is, you know, we take help wherever we can get it. Um, and so my, you know, my mother-in-law um, is often a regular feature in, in our household. Um, you know, nurseries, schools, um, whatever, whatever there is. I've, you know, sometimes I've, um, I've, I've brought my older son in here. Yeah. Um, and you know, he knows, he knows what pension B yeah. is. Um, and now my daughter's talking about it as well. You, you kind of just, you know, your worlds merge, I think. And you, you have to be quite accepting of that. Um, and just try, try your best to be a good parent, try your best you know, to be, to be a good CEO, um, try your best to be a good partner and yeah. just get on with it. Yeah. Low levels of sleep predictability. I mean, it's a phrase <laughs> I will uh, be repeating in particular this is 40 degree heat on the day that we're recording this as well. Um, what's one piece of kind of content that you have consumed, be it a book or a podcast or something that you have found particularly inspiring kind of on your journey, that's been a kind of cornerstone of it? Book or podcast? It's just a piece of content because I get told off for saying that, like, or the, giving the impression that entrepreneurs read books. <laughs> like, there are there are other ways of being inspired. Um. Yeah, I think it's a it's it's a good question. I actually, this is, you know, this isn't exciting. This is going to be a bit boring, but I like reading, um, you know, the HBR's top ten articles mm -hmm. uh, of the year. Because I I find that you know the challenges that you face as a business leader are, um, you know they're they're global they're consistent and one of the ones that really stuck with me recently was about how as a world we are managing through anxiety, uh, and this you know the th this heightened sense of there is a lot happening there is a lot happening to us there is a lot happening to us right now. That, of course, that filters into the workplace and you have to understand, you know, how do you manage through anxiety, um, which brings us back to, I think, where we started on the values and, and making sure that you have values that, you know, people, people aspire to and yeah. they create the kind of workplace that, that you want to have. But yeah, I like to be inspired by what other, you know, what, what are the challenges of the business world and. These yeah, days. yeah, and that yeah, that's a, a great thing. And the final question is um, passing the mic to another entrepreneur that we may not have come across yet or or heard of. Is there somebody that you have uh, come across lately that you think is particularly inspiring that we should pass the mic to? Yes, so I am uh, invested in a business called Seen on Screen. Yeah, um, it is a business that um, has female empowerment at its core. And it teaches uh, women how to dance like their favorite celebrities, both online and offline, um, and can be an amazing way to, um, well, you know, get that sense of empowerment yeah. while also doing something healthy for yourself, which is much needed these days. Yeah, amazing. And also deals with the anxiety side of things as, as <laughs> well. And what's the, uh, what's the name of the entrepreneur? Bonnie Lister Parsons. Brilliant. You should get in touch with her and tell, and 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 have her tell you the story all about how she sees female empowerment. Yeah, yeah. No, that sounds fabulous. We'll definitely do that. Rory, thanks so much for your time. It's been wonderful to get such a great insight into one of the UK's top entrepreneurial stories of the last decade. Thank you for having me. This show is made possible by the fantastic support of our various partners. And I wanted to thank The Octopus Group. The Octopus Group is a collection of eight entrepreneurially minded businesses across financial services and energy, all founded on the one simple belief that people and the planet deserve better. They are intent on building a better tomorrow for future generations and are a certified B Corp. 
demonstrating they care as much about the impact of their investments as the returns they generate. I am proud that Octopus have backed this show since the second series, and they are the reason why we are now able to put such a professional show together. To hear more about what they do, it is worth checking out previous episodes with the founders Chris Hewlett and Simon Rogerson, or the CEO of their investments arm, Ruth Hancock. If you want to see how you could partner with us, go to our website at www.jobsofthefuture.co.